study that I will be presenting to you today um, is uh, basically um, circles around the question that you see on the screen, what makes an open source project critical to a democratic, a democratic uh, uh, group? Uh, this is part of a, a broader study on uh, critical digital infrastructure that we uh, conducted at the Digital Civil Society Lab uh, at Stanford University uh, with my collaborators that you see here, Jessica Feldman and Lucy Bernholtz. In this presentation, I will give you an overview of this study and the methodology and um, focus on the two um, parts that you see on your screens. What is critical digital infrastructure? And the key here is what is critical infrastructure and according to whom? And we um, basically notice that this really matters. And then um, uh, this, this, uh, this part mostly looks at um, uh, it, this part is mostly based on uh, a regulatory and case law analysis. And then we're going into the ethnographic study. This is what uh, Jessica Feldman mostly conducted, uh, where we reached um, uh, developers, open software um, uh, developers and teams uh, to see what they think is critical. And uh, spoiler alert, there was a mismatch between what uh, the regulation uh, thinks is critical and what um, laws around different jurisdictions that we looked at um, define as critical or imply as critical and what uh, groups that are democratically governed and or um, are democratic groups considered consider as critical. So the idea behind this um, um, methodology and the mixing of methods, um, making a scholarly analysis, a regular a case law, a legal uh, analysis, um, regulatory and case law analysis, looking into um, uh, the market and finally realizing that there's a third space, uh, that of civil society that is under uh, searched, is what really drove the, the methodology. Uh, I'll be covering the first two. These are what I'm, I'm mostly um, sort of an expert on. And, and we'll be presenting also the findings on uh, the ethnography and civil society. And I um, apologize in advance for um, my lack of expertise in, in this uh, part. So the elephant in the room, what is infrastructure? That was the, the first um, difficult question that we had to encounter um, because we could see that um, a lot of policy documents, uh, scholarship, um, uh, legislation was basically implying that infrastructure is one, invisible. However, we know it when we see it. This is a famous phrase from a, from a Supreme Court justice um, uh, in a case of the 60s, and uh, that infrastructure is critical, uh, and we know that when it breaks down. So this was kind of the concurrent theme in, in trying to define infrastructure and try to define also criticality. Looking deeper into uh, our sources, uh, we have uh, we propose a, a, a little bit more um, uh, a, a slightly richer um, um, picture of what is infrastructure. Uh, besides the fact that it uh, sometimes is invisible and uh, becomes visible upon breakdown, infrastructure or infrastructures have value. Their value is usually defined by the resources that they um, uh, help communicate. Infrastructure has public goods and sometimes also natural monopoly attributes. This was mostly, um, um, there's a consensus in, in economics uh, scholarship there. And then uh, I think that it is important uh, also when we think about uh, the repercussions that this will have in open source uh, to understand that infrastructure is usually built on an installed base. So there's an element of path dependency. Um, linked to that, but not identical, is the fact that infrastructure is relational. So uh, it might enable, infrastructures might enable some people not not necessarily all, uh, all of them the classic example of of uh, staircase where um, 
the staircase is an infrastructure that uh, is useful for me uh, because I'm, I can walk. If I was on a wheelchair, uh, it would not be uh, as useful. And then um, very ample scholarship and ample uh, evidence on, on infrastructure's political um, nature. Infrastructure is not a political. Um, diving, delving into uh, legislation and regulation, mostly looking at the European Union and the US, um, the report uh, that we produced for the Ford Foundation is quite US-centric. We uh, use different jurisdictions to compare. We started identifying benchmarks of criticality, first from the perspective of the legislation and the re regulation, therefore from the perspective of the nation state. And there uh, we see a, a dominant presence of the um, uh, of security and lately cybersecurity as as perhaps the number one uh, benchmark for criticality. Public health and safety come immediately after, and then also reliability and resilience, which are mostly requirements uh, for rather than of criticality. Um, the the interesting uh, part is that we, we could uh, see uh, analyzing uh, the development of, of case law, particularly in the cybersecurity sector uh, in the Western world, uh, this, uh, this um, um, emphasis on security and then on cybersecurity is uh, evident, is evident in the uh, rules, it's also evident in the language that all these rules use. So I will give some examples here. The Critical Infrastructure Protection Act of 2001, which gives the um, definition of critical infrastructure that is always cited in later um, um, regulations as well in the US, so it's still uh, the, the authoritative um, uh, legislative definition. Infrastru critical infrastructure uh, is systems, assets, physical or virtual, that are so vital for the country that their construction in capacity, in capacity will have a deliberating impact to national security, national economic security, and national public health and safety. The uh, comparison with the, uh, the equivalent uh, uh, definitions that we see in the European Union usually add, add a social um, uh, element where um, the destruction is not only on the secure national security and uh, economic security, but also on um, social affairs. Interestingly, in the 2002 Homeland Security Act, you can see another definition, this time of critical infrastructure information, which I think is also important for our discussion here, since we're, uh, we, a lot of you already touched upon the interplay between um, our, our discussion in the intellectual property rules. So interestingly there, the term critical infrastructure information means is defined by this act as information not customarily in the public domain. So the, the assumption is that we're talking about proprietary information related again to security of critical infrastructure or protected systems. These are just snippets of, of uh, rules that we looked at. We looked at a, a number of, uh, in, in the US, we looked at um, um, various um, rules uh, on public utilities and uh, both um, uh, intangible and tangible, um, mostly tangible, I would say, so that we understand whether the um, the kind of rules that we've seen um, for critical digital for critical infrastructures and for critical infrastructure information at the federal level match the state level and uh, it does. I'm very happy to talk more about the, the um, kind of state level regulation which revealed um, a very sort of interesting um, um, spaces and regulatory spaces but they're not linked to um, software as much uh, so um, i decided to not um, bother you with all these details now since we're talking here uh, with a crowd that that is mostly also focused in uh, on the european union i wanted to add this um jump no this this uh, transition uh that we are um expecting from nice one to nice two and see um what is the european union uh, legislator adding to this um, um, discussion. Uh, are the benchmarks of the EU legislator similar? Is the focus on, on security again dominant? 
um, just to add uh, more more uh, terms into our um, terminology tools. The um, NIST one talks about operators of essential services, and that's what I'm using as the equivalent of critical infrastructure, and defines these as uh, entities that provide services that are essential for the maintenance of critical societal and economic activities. Of course, the interplay with words everywhere doesn't help um, uh, doesn't help us much, but um, more or less, when the uh, union talks about essential services, it means what the um, equivalent U uh, US uh, rules um, define as critical infrastructures. And um, the interesting thing, I think, for the way in which the European Union is going and is thinking about criticality of its infrastructures, one is that uh, more and more it the critical infrastructure and critical digital infrastructure becomes the same, they come together, which also happened uh, if you look at the uh, progression of the US uh, rules uh, legislation in the same space. But also uh, NIS2 uh, introduces yet another just distinction, uh, creating sort of ranking of criticality, which I find very interesting. Uh, and it might be worth um, uh, our attention, especially now that NIS2 is not yet um, law. So uh, this new distinction is between essential and important entities. So essential is the, the highest um, uh, in the, the highest uh, spot in the pyramid. And the examples of critical or essential services, these critical sectors are on your screens. Um, uh, again, very similar to the sectors that are defined and regulated as critical in the United States and in Canada, and I'm starting to look at now. So uh, I've also highlighted um, point seven, which is how NIS2 defines, and, and NIS1 defines digital infrastructure. And just to connect a little bit also with the immediately previous um, uh, presentations, the infrastructures of public administration, which are also increasingly becoming digital, are uh, included in the list of NIS2 now as um, uh, important, as essential entities, so the, the highest of uh, ranking of criticality. And uh, um, for, for uh, the purposes of our study, we continued looking at more um, uh, legislation and regulation, also try to link cybersecurity with uh, different um, sectors that also touch upon um, uh, infrastructure, not only in directly, but, but also indirectly. So we started looking at um, rules on uh, pu the public's access and accessibility to critical infrastructures, and then um, rules of the market, which brought about more uh, benchmarks of criticality, in addition to the three firsts that you saw also earlier, national security, cybersecurity, public health and safety, reliability and resilience. So we add this element of access or accessibility, um, competitiveness, and interoperability, interoperability, especially with regard to um, um, public infrastructures. And here is when we shift towards the, the um, um, novel part of our study, where we wonder where is participation? Why isn't participation um, critical in the um, ways in which either the market or the nation state think about critical infrastructures. And we, um, we're we still, um, uh, we, I, I, I would love to hear your feedback on that. Um, uh, we think that we need to sort of identify each, um, each um, sector with at least one benchmark of criticality that looks uh, to, that is the most dominant. And I think that for nation state security is, is clearly the dominant uh, benchmark. For the market, we were um, uh, thinking about um, sort of the, the whether it's, it's necessary to pinpoint one benchmark of criticality. It seemed that, that this notion of profit making or exclusivity 
uh, taking from intellectual property rights uh, could be the uh, most identified, uh, the mostly identifiable uh, benchmark. But I more uh, and more, um, uh, especially reading a recent case law on uh, antitrust and intellectual property and the sort of software battles um, that are are prominent in both sides of the Atlantic. I think that competitiveness uh, seems to be the most um, um, appropriate um, uh, term if we want to uh, highlight or, or um, discern one critical one benchmark of criticality for the market, although it doesn't necessarily need to be one. Um, and there we come in with our ethnography, uh, wanting to ask uh, democratic groups and mostly open source uh, developers that either um, that first of all want to uh, govern their own um, uh, community democratically and also want to uh, build uh, tools for democracy. What do they think about uh, criticality and are they uh, in alignment with the way in which um, our rules and regulations and our nation states define criticality in infrastructure and in digital infrastructure? Are they in alignment with the way in which markets define criticality? That's pretty, that's perhaps the, the easy part, as we also always thought of the open source community in um, um, thinking of it in antithesis with uh, the market. And there, um, our, our findings confirmed the hypothesis that was uh, basically that participation is uh, critical for um, communities of builders of, of open source. And um, our initial effort within the, the um, uh, or hope that we will find um, uh, more benchmarks when asking um, in, in our ethnographic study, when asking our interviewees, what do they define as critical in their work um, was, um, I think was um, uh, misguided. What we found is that um, it was difficult for our interviewees to pinpoint um, elements of criticality. And this is a, a quote here from uh, one of our interviewees saying that pretty much everything is critical uh, in the sense that projects fall apart, not necessarily because of lack of um, uh, expertise or, or knowledge, uh, but they might fall apart technically and politically, mostly um, because uh, of lack of participation. And that was very critical to that community. Um, now I'm, I'm uh, entering the um, uh, results of the ethnographic study and I will be presenting the part that, that my colleague um, um, is, is mostly responsible for. So I'm trying to, to uh, do my best here to uh, not misrepresent it. Uh, so apologies for any, any mistakes. The, the, the basic three um, um, clusters or, or chunks of, of challenges to participation that we discern from the ethnographic studies are social, cultural, economic, and technical and organizational. The social cultural aspect of the challenges. Um, here uh, are some representative quotes from uh, our interviewees pointing to this uh, categorization that we decided, the social, cultural, um, technical, and um, um, economic one. So um, the complexity of introducing new people into the community was um, emphasized by, by one of the, by a lot of our, our interviewees actually. Um, this is probably the most uh, interesting one for me. These, um, there, there's a big discussion that I think uh, Sivan also um, um, mentioned a, a little bit earlier about the um, difficulty of, of sustaining um, an open source project, um, especially because behind the, the scenes, um, uh, the, the project might really um, rely upon very few people or one person that, uh, and, and this famous sort of, um, um, anecdote that uh, this person is hit by a bus, uh, then, then the project is, is up in the air. Well, the, uh, one of our interviewees um, said that, well, the, that really has not happened. And the real problem is bosses, not buses. Usually the um, 
person that would be uh, devoting their time into an open source project might just become extremely busy because the, the priorities of uh, their um, their work and uh, the priorities um, that was where and the, the kind of um, um, new direction that that um, their bosses gave um, made them lose time completely and, and, and need to abandon the project. So um, I think this this might be tying very well to discussions that we had and that we will have on on ways in which we uh, need to not only fund but make space and and time uh, available for open source um, builders. And finally, the technical and organizational complexities and challenges. Um, the um, computer scientist that you see quoted here said that open source is a new way of developing. There is a new there are new scientific issues uh, there to develop um, quality software because it's different from the traditional way of doing this. This notion of participation comes into the very definition not only of criticality but of open source, which I think is is important to remember. Um, I was recently um, listening to another discussion on on um, the future of open source, and um, I will um, I will steal this um, this quote. Um, uh, I'm I'm terrible because I cannot remember uh, who to uh, properly attribute this to, but. The, the gist was basically that even the term open source is not an open source um, uh, definition, right? And uh, with that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much. Um, I haven't prepared a questionnaire. Uh, I think that what I would have asked is, is your take on our normative part once we identify this mismatch between the prioritization that the market and the nation states um, uh, give when it comes to criticality. And also a mismatch between our understanding and approach of criticality of public infrastructures, which rely on, on private digital systems quite a bit. Uh, what is what is the uh, bottom line? What do we want to do um, going forward? First of all, to what extent do we need to address this mismatch across the board and how? And I think that the, the, the term prioritization is for me important here. And uh, another, another issue that I think that we are um, um, uh, mostly concerned about with, with, the, with our report at the end is um, whether the um, tackling and giving answers with regard to software as infrastructure in and with in order to address this mismatch is enough. We are uh, moving further away from um, this division of uh, software and, and hardware. Um, a good example that really accelerated this discussion uh, in the US was the attack, the cyber attack in the pipeline colonial, um, um, in the colonial pipeline in May 2021. So uh, policy, uh, from policy perspective, it might be um, it might be advisable or it might be um, uh, the timing might be good to stop um, talking only about uh, software, but um, open up the discussion on the um, bundle of um, the cyber and the physical part of our infrastructures. And with that, I thank you very much. I think I stopped sharing. Let's see. Great. Thank you, Aguri. Um, it's very interesting. And I already have a few questions myself. So let's see if I get those in uh, when we have a discussion in a little bit. But um, well, next up, um, uh, Patrick Iwimeki, who I invite to come onto the stage here now uh, to talk about um, uh, the X Road project slash the X Road product um, that they are maintaining. Ah, I can see Patrick is coming on. Hello. Hopefully, you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. A lot of people are having a bit of fun with the whiteboard that uh, I don't quite know how to turn off anyway. So go ahead, have some fun. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, Patrick, if you would like to, you can share your, your presentation. Um, and then we can get going. Yeah, I'm about to do it. Now it should be shared. Can you see it? Yes, it's coming on. Yes, Perfect. great. great. 
Okay, thank you, sir, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Petteri Kivimäki. I'm the CTO of Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions, NIS for short. Uh, my topic today is joint open source development in cross-border context, and my approach to the topic is, is very, very practical. So, uh, I'm going to approach the topic through XROAD data exchange layer. Uh, first, a couple of words about XROAD so that you know what it is and what it does. Uh, but then my main focus is on the development model of XROAD and NIS as the core development organization. So first, uh, let's start uh, from XROAD, what it is and, and what it does. So XROAD is an open source software and ecosystem solution that provides unified and secure way to exchange data between organizations. Uh, XROAD is also a digital public good verified by the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and it's released under the MIT open source license. Uh, from technical perspective, XROAD is based on distributed architecture, uh, and it's also based on so-called four-corner model. And the uh, main idea of, of the model is that uh, organizations, uh, when, when they exchange data, their information systems, they are not connected directly, but instead uh, they are connected through unified access points. And in the XROAD architecture, those access points, they are called security servers. And uh, XROAD, it, it creates kind of a secure peer-to-peer -peer network when organizations uh, exchange data directly with each other. So there's no uh, centralized uh, message brokers or, or any central components uh, that would process the data uh, that is exchanged. Uh, however, some uh, central components are present in the XROAD architecture and they are uh, needed for, for creating uh, the trust between the members. Uh, so we have the central uh, components of XROAD and then external trust services. Uh, but they don't play active role in the actual data exchange. And the uh, most typical way how XROAD is implemented is uh, at the national level. Uh, like you, you have maybe heard about the XROAD implementation in Estonia. So uh, XROAD is used there as a national data exchange layer. Uh, it, it, it is it's operated by the public administration, uh, but all kinds of organizations can, can join and exchange data with each other. So, so the actual data exchange, it's, it's not only for, for the public sector, but also for, for the private sector. And also Finland and Iceland have, have similar implementations. And in addition to uh, technology, XROAD also provides an organizational framework. So it, it defines uh, a set of different roles and their responsibilities. Uh, XROAD operator is the organization who runs the XROAD ecosystem, defines the rules, sets the policies, decides who can join. And then we have different kind of organizations as service consumers and service providers that, that exchange data with each other. And uh, to, be, to become members of these ecosystems, they must go through an onboarding process during which uh, their identity is uh, verified by the XROAD operator and also by external trust service providers. And uh, like I mentioned uh, today, uh, in Europe, XROAD is used in Estonia, uh, in Finland and in Iceland. Uh, but in addition to that, XROAD is used all around the world. There are several implementations in uh, South America and Asia, uh, I think also something in, in Africa. Uh, so uh, today, XROAD really is a global, global solution. Uh, but originally, it was developed in Estonia, and the first uh, version was released uh, 20 years ago in 2001. Uh, however, back then, uh, XROAD wasn't an open source solution. And uh, it, it really became an open source solution uh, years ago in 2013. Uh, in 2000, everything uh, started in 2013 uh, when Estonia 
added uh, the source code of XROAD to Finland. And Finland started its own XROAD implementation project in, in 2014. Uh, originally, uh, the idea was that Finland wanted to just uh, take the software, implement it, and build their own ecosystem. Uh, Finland didn't have any intention to uh, develop it further or do any, any changes to the source code, uh, just an off-the-self de deployment without any changes. Uh, however, uh, during the implementation project, uh, Finland realized that some changes were needed and uh, therefore they started to develop XROAD by, on their own. And uh, Estonia was developing the software at the same time. And, uh, in, in this kind of a situation, if uh, the different parties who are developing the software, they don't develop, uh, they don't coordinate development activities in any way, uh, there is a pretty big risk uh, that, uh, that a fork is created and, and then uh, the two different development branches, they are not compatible uh, with each other anymore. And this was a situation that both Finland and Estonia wanted to avoid from the beginning. So they both wanted uh, that uh, they, they are using the same software and in cases changes are needed, they, they develop it together. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, both countries, they have th had their own uh, development resources, development teams, development environments, own backlogs and, and so on. And the development activities were coordinated uh, by, by a, by a so-called working group uh, that was meeting one, once in a month basis or so. But uh, this kind of model, it, it had a pretty much overhead and uh, the idea uh, that a shared organization uh, that would be responsible for the development would be a lot more efficient way of, of doing things. And eventually uh, this led uh, to the uh, establishment of NIS in, in 2017. And uh, here is a summary of the X road development responsibilities before uh, NIS was established and uh, well then once once NIS was established and the development responsibilities were handed over to NIS. So NIS was established in, in 2017 uh, then we needed to some, some time to ramp up the organization and the development activities were handed over to us in, in 2018. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, before NIS, uh, well, everything uh, had to be done twice in Finland and in Estonia. And uh, once, uh, once NIS was formed, we, we took the responsibilities and, and uh, after that, no, uh, there are no overlapping responsibilities anymore. And, uh, Overall, uh, you can say that NIS is the software vendor of XROAD. Uh, XROAD is open source, so we are not actually selling anything, but, but you get the point. Also, uh, an open source software needs to have an organization who is, who is responsible for, for the development, managing the backlog, uh, uh, the documentation and, and so on, running all the development activities. And that's exactly what NIS is doing. Uh, and our development model works so uh, that our own core organization is, is very, very small. Uh, we are only five people working at NIS. And then we are using, um, using development partners uh, to, to actually uh, do, do the development. So we, we uh, organize procurements and then uh, we, we use commercial, commercial companies providing development services. And our uh, working model uh, works, works so that uh, we don't, when we organize procurements, we don't do requirements, uh, requirements and we don't define a set of features that we want to be developed, uh, but instead we define uh, a set of skills that we are looking for uh, 
kind of developer profiles and then we we look for a specific number of, of de developers with those skills and then we work on day-to-day -day basis with the development themes using uh, agile development methods in in that way we we can very we are our developer model is, is very flexible in a sense that we don't need to know six months in advance what do we want to for example now we don't need to know exactly what we want to develop uh, next april or so uh, since we have the developers available all the time we can just update the backlog and and change the priorities according the according the needs and and requests of our members but then, in addition uh, to the actual development activities, we also provide second line support for our members. So, uh, uh, for example, Finland and Estonia, they have their own X-Road ecosystems. Uh, both ecosystems have hundreds of members. Sometimes those members, they need support. So when that happens, uh, Estonia and Finland, they, they both have their own own uh, organizations that are responsible for operating the ecosystems, providing support, and, and then in case uh, their own support organization is, is not able to help the members, they, they contact us. So the, the end users of, of X-Road in Estonia and Finland, uh, it's, it's uh, rare that they, they contact us. Uh, but they first contact their local support organization in case they are not able to help, they, they contact us. But at the same time, of course, XROAD has a wide open source community and, and through the community uh, we, we receive support requests as well. So, so it's, it's, it's not so black and white. And then, in, in general, we also do uh, lots of di different kind of international cooperation. And when it comes to NIS as an organization, we are a non-profit association uh, registered in Estonia. Currently, we have three members, Estonia, Finland and Iceland, and our funding comes directly from our members. Uh, the decision-making uh, model of NIS works so that the highest decision-making body is uh, the general meeting. Uh, they approve and monitor our strategy, budget and action plan. And uh, the general meeting, uh, it, it has representatives from, from all NIS members. Then we have an advisory group uh, that doesn't have a real decision-making power, uh, but the, ad the role of the advisory group is to support us in, in operational questions. Uh, then we have our management board, uh, uh, where we have uh, the CEO of NIS, uh, who is in who is uh, in charge of the day-to-day -day management of, of NIS. And finally, we have the X-Road working group uh, that is responsible for the, the technical decisions, technical discussions. And uh, uh, I actually mentioned the working group already earlier. So when Finland and Estonia started uh, the joint development in 2015, uh, the working group was, was established back then. And it, it has existed uh, since then uh, through, through all these years. And it's, its role, it, it has remained more or, more or less the same. And if we think about uh, the roles of uh, X-Road Working Group and X-Road Advisory Group uh, uh, on a very pra practical level, if we need to decide uh, whether we are going to implement some, some new feature that requires significant amount of time and money, then uh, we first uh, discuss it uh, at the working group. If, if uh, the working group think that it thinks that it's a good idea, then uh, we take it to the advisory group uh, uh, and the, the advisory group needs to, needs to approve it too. But then uh, when we start to implement that new feature and we need to make decision regarding uh, technical details, how something is implemented, then those discussions will take place at the working group level. So the working group is a, is a very, very hands-on level technical group. 
And uh, then actually we are also, we are about to establish a new uh, new working working group uh, well not new working group but a new collaboration group that's targeted to the X road uh, community because all these groups uh, that you see here general meeting advisory group X road working group they are uh, only for NIS members and NIS partners uh, we don't have representatives from the community in these groups and therefore we are about to e establish a new X road uh, community group that will consist of, of the open source community members and the idea is that we, we want uh, we want to involve uh, the community more in the development process and also hear hear their feedback hear their thoughts and and give, give them more opportunities to affect the extra development. And here is the X-Road uh, development model in, in one slide. Uh, but the main idea here is that uh, since X-Road is OVOS, one can contribute. And contributing means submitting enhancement requests, submitting uh, source code contributions, providing feedback. Well, uh, it, almost any, any kind of uh, in, interaction. And, uh, it doesn't matter who uh, who uh, submits the contribution it's always evaluated using the same criteria so it really doesn't matter if it's someone from the community or one of the NIS members uh, all the uh, contributions they are evaluated and then if, if they are approved if they are feature or enhancement requests when they are approved they are added to backlog and and prioritized and uh, like I mentioned before, we use agile development methods in, in our uh, development, uh, which means that we do development in, in sprints and every sprint we implement tickets from, from the top of the backlog. And we, we do two or three new X-Road releases per year. And the releases, they are always available to everyone at the same time. So when a new X-Road person is released, uh, both these members and the X-Road community will get, access it, uh, will get access to it exactly at the same time. And also our backlog source code repositories, uh, they are open to everyone. So uh, everyone can, can follow what, what we are doing in, in real time. Uh, and at this point, you might be wondering uh, that so if, if everything is open, everything is available uh, for free of charge, why someone would like to become a member of NIS? Because the, there is the annual membership fee to pay. And that's a good question. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, the community, yes, they get everything for free uh, at the same time with the members. Uh, but when it comes to the decision making, when we discuss the X road roadmap, we prioritize uh, the backlog, what, what items should be implemented now, uh, which ones can, can wait and they will be implemented next year, something will never be implemented and so on. Uh, in that case, uh, NIS, uh, NIS members make the decisions. So since, uh, since they, uh, they are responsible for funding the development activities, then of course they, they, they are also responsible for, for deciding what is being implemented and, and when. So uh, just using X-Road, uh, uh, anyone can do it, it's available to everyone, uh, but in case uh, you feel that uh, it's important to be able to participate in the decision making, then uh, the NIS membership is the way to do it. And of course, there are also other benefits. Uh, uh, we, we also facilitate uh, uh, cross-border collaboration between our members. And also, <clears throat> when it comes to the uh, X-Road development, uh, sometimes we, we do uh, these collaboration projects with our members. 
Uh, so sometimes one of our members, they, they need a feature that is not so interesting to the others, uh, but uh, that one member, they, they have uh, extra funds to pay for the development. And then uh, we, they, they uh, pay the development, but the development project, it, it, it is run in collaboration with us. And it pra in practice, it means that they, they provide uh, the developers who do the work, but the uh, developers are allowed to use our development tools, our development environments, our development processes, and we at NIS, uh, we, we facilitate and supervise the development work. Uh, but the member who, who wants to have the feature, they pay for it, and of course they, they own uh, own the deliverables, uh, but we we help them in the implementation, and we have done a couple of projects like this with our members, and uh, so far they, they have been pretty successful. So it, it's a very very good uh, way of collaborating. And then very very quickly about the X-Road community. Uh, this, uh, this picture was taken in 2015 uh, in the uh, Estonian community meetings, so very uh, local, local uh, and uh, when we took over the extra development, we also took over uh, the facilitation of the community, and we have act, act, tried to increase the number of the community members, and since 2017, it has increased from 50 members to, to over 1,000 members, uh, and uh, it can also be seen uh, when looking at the community event at, in 2019, our uh, late face-to-face -face community before COVID. So uh, the community has installed, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the number of active contributors is, is, isn't still too high. Maybe we have uh, had our 10 contributors uh, from the community during the last year, so pretty, pretty low number. That's uh, definitely something that we, we need to develop in the future. There is a huge potential in the community, but we need to find ways to act them more. Finally, here's uh, the world map of X-Road. You can see the three NIS member countries, and uh, the, the purple X-Road logos are uh, that have already implemented, uh, implemented X-Road and the rest are countries where X-Road is in a consultation phase or X-Road is, is being considered but, but not implemented yet. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Great, thanks, Petteri. Um, here we are. I'm coming online. Um, okay, uh, we are, I'm a little bit conscious of time, but uh, let's see if we can get maybe one or two questions in. Um, also, Agiri, if you want to come back on, uh, you're very welcome to. I'm wondering maybe I can check if Jessica has also made it, but I'm not sure. I don't think so. So it'll just be the three of us. Um, one thing that I was wondering, this goes to Agiri, uh, I thought it was quite interesting um, that in this one directive, always uses the operator terminology of course that's in an open source context quite uh, quite relevant because um, uh, software is often not provided by the operator but it's provided as is and you know it's essentially somebody maintains it in the best in, in, in a good scenario somebody maintains it that even that is always of course the situation in reality so I'm wondering has this evolved within this two directive um, because that might be a you know a way of looking at things that um, might not be 100% up to date. Um, and then I'm wondering a little bit, how do you see this? Uh, how, how could you see this evolve? Should the responsibility always be on the operator? Um, I'm sure that's a bit of a discussion on that area. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's a fair question. Also, a, a small uh, sort of clarification when I was uh, talking about the, the needs regulations and the previous ones, the, the uh, steps is from um, defining critical inf infrastructure to critical infrastructure to critical digital infrastructure and software. So mm -hmm. you're right to, to point that. Um, I think that um, 
there is um, I, I should look back into where we are right now with NIST two to see if this is uh, set in stone. If the if the um, uh, the state the, the I don't think that the definition and the use of the term of a, a essential operator will change because this comes from NIS one. But still, there there are differentiations that might. So uh, I could look uh, again into that. Whether that's helpful for the purposes of NIS perhaps because it's talking about liability of cybersecurity uh, in, in the cybersecurity context for maintenance and for non-crisis um, sort of management, non-situations non, uh, uh, of, of, hack, of, 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 of yeah, hacking attacks. Uh, I think that we probably, I, I, I agree with what I think you're, you're uh, pointing out that um, it's not about operators only, right? Yeah, um, I think well, there's more to consider than just the operator, right? And the Absolutely. question is a little I bit. Agree. Um... I, I agree, and I think this also is this limitation and the mismatch that um, when we talk about critical infrastructure in um, from the perspective of nation states, only f f focusing on security will also uh, lead us to focus on incidents of uh, cyber security uh, vulnerability and then on specific layers and leave completely um, uh, out of sight uh, the actual work. And I think that the coming with listening to Peter uh, coming immediately after uh, the, the importance of self-governance, especially if I understood it well towards uh, within your your uh, presentation of your own um, uh, group, which is uh, an NGO, no, oh, it's not a it's not a uh, an operator under uh, the the directive for for instance, mm -hmm. this would be under our um, under civil society, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, are not captured well from mm -hmm. the um, definitions of our our regulations in the EU in yeah. the US. And I, I don't want to um, overgeneralize because we did not really look at too many jurisdictions beyond that. But, yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I know it's a good Patrick. Yeah, yeah, just, just wanted to add that it's it's I think it's also important to understand in, in context of context of X road, but probably this applies to many other solutions as well. But yeah, I, I use the word operator, uh, but in, in the context of X road, operator is the organization who is responsible for running and operating the X road instance. And then we have to separate the software vendor that in, in this case is us, me, is the, the NGO. Uh, and, and I think that both, both roles are important and, and they should be recognized and, and not mixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from from, <laughs> from this one to Nice. Um, yeah, and I think you know this also kind of points toward the the kind of the hyper and interdependent system um, that forms because of course there's different dependencies that are existing there, and that also speaks I think to kind of our general modern world and something that hasn't been kind of I think captured in the in the legislation. There's also the red directive, which uh, you know the uh, radio equipment directive, which is being updated right now, um, and there it's a little bit the same. The focus is very much on um, uh, on 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 um, on a model that you know has been working for a very long time, but might not always be still the way uh, things work. There's a manufacturer, and then they put out a product. Uh, in in the red directive, that's the kind of the thinking. They put out the product, and then they they have certain. Um, then it, it need, the product needs to work on the day they put it out, um, and then it's kind of out of our hands a little bit. They say, or oh, that's kind of the the um, the, the the thinking. Um, but of course, today the situation is very different. You want to have updates. You you might want to have some obligations possibly uh, on continued updates, etc. So it's quite uh, it's quite interesting how this uh, how kind of the regulatory framework reacts to this. Um, one question actually uh, to Petteri from my side um, is, of course, a very interesting and really kind of fantastic way of, on, and also in some sense, a pragmatic way, um, needs that is to work together in a cross border way. You, you, you talked about you know, the concerns that Finland had and the concerns that Estonia had and why they come up with the solution. But I guess, as you said, there's currently uh, NIS develops X Road. There's some community contribution to it, but it's relatively limited. Um, so if Nice goes away, let's just imagine. Then um, what, what what happens if Nice goes Nice goes away? Can somebody else take this over? It's open source, of course, but um, um, yeah, yeah, that that's a very good good question. Uh, so uh, X Road is open source, and anyone could 
anyone would take it over and there are many companies that that are already working with xroad so we know that there is there is uh, the required knowledge in the market mm -hmm. uh, but if if we think about how xroad is used it's it's a part of a critical digital infrastructure in in several countries in these member countries and other countries as well so I would say that the first case scenario is that w we would need to go back to the uh, model that we had before 2018, uh, meaning that every XROAD user country would have their own development team, own their own backlogs, their own development teams, and, and so on. And then uh, in the worst case, they, they would do the development work in, in silos, or, or they would have to have to coordinate it like, like it was done in the past. Uh, but the main point is that uh, since it's it's so critical uh, component in many countries, you can't just uh, quit the development and and leave it there uh, because well all the software it needs updates regularly and if if that is ignored then then you have a big problem in your hands sooner or later usually rather sooner than later. Mm -hmm.